Today's presentation on the Nick Collection 3 is all about non-destructive editing in Lightroom Classic. The ability to you now have to go back into your photos and re-edit them, pick up where you left off at any time. The way we're going to do today's presentation is broken into two and a half, three-ish parts. In the beginning, what I'm going to do is just show you how the technology works. I'm going to jump into a plugin, make some changes, jump out of it, show you kind of what's happening behind the scenes, and then we'll go back in and edit it. We'll talk about a few different approaches to re-editing photos, some things that are worth knowing about inside of Lightroom. Um, part two or one and a half, if you will, um, today's presentation isn't about the Perspective Effects plugin, so I'm not going to focus on that. It is actually not a non-destructive one. You can't go back and re-edit that because of the nature of how it works. But because it is a new plugin, I do want to show that to you as well. I don't want to leave it out. So we're just going to do a little bit around that. And because we're coming out of Lightroom, I'm going to show you a particular example of a photo that you can't perspective correct automatically in Lightroom, but will work phenomenally well in DxO's uh, Nick Collection Perspective Effects Pro. And then for the, the last part, the second and a half, third part, whatever you want to call it, we're just going to play. I have a few photos that I'm going to open up and we're going to explore the plugins, do some editing to them, back out of it, go back in and make some changes and we'll see kind of how this whole thing works together. So with all that said, let's get started in Lightroom Classic. I'm going to start with this photo here, a nice big group photo. This is actually from something called the Kumela in India. Did a, a workshop there last year, two years ago, whatever it was. And I'm going to start by opening this one in ColorFX Pro. Now this is a raw file starting off raw in Lightroom. So before I can open this into a plugin, I do have to create a version of this, a new version of this that is a TIFF file. Now you'll notice here, first of all, what to edit is the first question. Am I editing a copy with Lightroom adjustments, a copy of the original file without Lightroom adjustments or just the original? And I can't choose either of these yet because I'm starting with raw, I only have one choice. So that is an easy decision. Down here, you'll see you have the choice between a TIFF, a PSD or a JPEG file. Now, you can certainly do a JPEG, although honestly, I'm not quite sure why you would. You are certainly limiting what you can do with that file and the quality of it. So um, I don't know why you might want to use JPEG. You have the option if you want to. You could use PSD and you'll get many of the same functionality, but you won't get the ability to re-edit. If you want to be able to re-edit your photo, you have to choose TIFF. And this is because this re-edit ability is based off of something called multi-page TIFF technology. So uh, it's right there in the name, you're going to need to choose the TIFF file. So I choose the TIFF file. You can choose whatever color space you want. You can choose eight or 16 bit. I'm actually going to drop this one to eight because it's a fairly flat file. May as well change, uh, may as well save some space here and click on edit. So now Lightroom is creating that TIFF file, eight bit in this case, and it's going to open it into ColorFX Pro 4. Um, now at this point, I can do whatever I want to do this, right? So I could go in here and start editing away. Um, adding some effects to this. I'm actually going to, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to realize that I actually intended to not go into ColorFX Pro, but to go into Analog Effects Pro. I just finished a demo doing Color Effects, but I want to play with Analog Effects. So I'm going to choose that TIFF that I just created, edit this in Analog Effects. Now, because I've already created the TIFF, I don't have to recreate it. I'm just going to go ahead and say edit original because it's it's that TIFF file, but it didn't actually do anything too. So let us pick up where I left off here. All right, so opening this up into analog effects, the first thing that pops up, you see this dialogue that says, hey, this is good to know if you're working with a TIFF file. And this is the dialogue that I'm going to leave up. It's going to keep coming up. You can, of course, dismiss it at any point if you want to. But this is the dialogue that is telling me with a TIFF file, I have the ability to re-edit it. But to do that, I have to click the magic checkbox. So that magic check checkbox is down here next to the cancel and save buttons. You'll see here it says save and edit later. And it warns you that it is going to make larger files. And this is important to understand. It is going to make a larger file because effectively what you're going to have is multiple TIFF files within a single file. It's the multi-page TIFF file. I guess we could say it's multiple pages, um, kind of like layers, not really, but kind of. But effectively, you're going to have multiple versions of the image within a single file. So your files will get bigger. And I would say at this point that we know that storage is cheap these days it's there's really no problem having really really big uh, libraries tons and tons of photos library size maybe what you'll do is towards the end of an editing process if you really want to kind of flatten things out you can make a new copy that's flattened out and get rid of all the extra data that's up to you but um, for the most part if you want to be able to re-edit them you check that box it is going to make bigger files just something to know about okay so now we're in analog effects pro let's play around i'm going to just kind of click a couple of presets in here and um, and for the sake of this demo what i really want to do is show you the re-editing so i'm just going to settle on one of these and apply it and i think the one that i'm going to settle on is this one here called classic camera 5. 
kind of a cool look, definitely unique. It's different from where we started and it's got some heavy vignetting on it. And you know, it's kind of cool, right? All right, so that's cool. I wanna save this. Again, I make sure that save and edit later is enabled. Click on save. It's going to apply this back into Lightroom. And at this point, whether it's a minute later, a week later, a year later, I go, oh, you know, I should have made some changes to this. I love the look, but the vignetting is just, it's just too much, it's too strong. So maybe what I should do is kind of back off on that vignetting a little bit. Previously, if you were using Nick 2.5 or earlier, you would have to start all over again, but now we can re-edit this. Now, before I jump back into it, I wanna show you how this actually works. If I right click on that thumbnail, then I choose show in Finder, there's the TIFF file, and then I'll open this in preview. And in preview, we're gonna see exactly what's happening. There is the original image, and there is that new version of it. This is that multi-page. These are the two pages of the TIFF file. In between here, what we're not seeing is the invisible metadata. This is the metadata that will that is embedded in the file that tells the plugin exactly what was happening. So it's not just a, a version of it. It's not just a flattened TIFF. There is actually the instructions in there that tell the plugin what was changed to result in this view. So now let's go back into Lightroom, and I will right-click again and choose Edit In. Analog Effects Pro 2. We're gonna go back in here, and at this point, to re-edit it, very important, I edit the original. Editing the original opens that multi-page file. So I click on Edit, and you'll see here, as it starts to draw, you're gonna see the original image and then the filters drawing on top of it. So you already know, the game is given away, that the filters that I had applied were not permanent. So you can see the original there, you see it's adding the texture and uh, whatever else it's gonna to need to add to it and there is that image, there's that result. So at this point, as I said, I felt that the vignetting was a little bit on the strong side. So I'll go over here to the lens vignette option. If I just toggle it off, we'll see it just, I can just get rid of it entirely, but I wanna just back it off a little bit. Let's take the amount, make it a little bit less dramatic, maybe change the shape of it instead of circular. Let's give it a slight rectangular hint to it so we get the darkening on the edges there as well. And yeah, I like it, so that's cool. I'm gonna go ahead and apply that. All right, so there's the basics of how the multi-page TIFF works and how you can go back in and re-edit it. But now let's take that to kind of a next level and see what else we can do with this multi-page idea. So if you look down in the bottom left corner here, you'll see I've got my original raw image. So that's still, of course, intact and, and untouched. And then there's the TIFF file that I just created, which I then re-edited to back off in the vignetting. Looking at this photo now, I'm looking at it and I might be thinking, you know, the the saturation in these oranges up here is a it's a little bit much but maybe it's not maybe it is maybe it's not so i want to change it but i don't want to lose this version of it so i want to have another version of this photo that i can still go back and edit but i want a new version of it with a little bit less orange so basically i want two editable files two editable versions so i'm going to go ahead and right click on this once again choose edit in analog effects pro once again and this time, instead of editing the original, I'm gonna edit a copy. Not edit a copy with Lightroom adjustments. If I choose this top version, it is going to flatten down the TIFF file. It's going to flatten this out and make a new TIFF. But if I choose edit a copy, it is quite simply duplicating that multi-page TIFF and opening that multi-page TIFF. So now I have two, two multi-page TIFF files that I can work with. So now let's go into here and I'm going to do a little uh, do a little extra work to the oranges in here. So let that render out. And um, like I said, I want to kind of desaturate the oranges in here. Now, if I look at my saturation adjustments, so up here on the top right, see basic adjustments, I can take the saturation down, but that's a global effect. And I actually really like the rest of the saturation. I like the saturation on the orange or the saffron clothing that people are wearing down here. So I don't want to lose all of that. So what I'll do instead is I'll use a control point. Let me back that off a touch. I'm gonna to use control points here and I'll add a control point to this orange rooftop there. And before I make any changes, I'm just gonna look at the mask for that and see what that's affecting. So there we can see that's gonna affect quite clearly the white areas of the mask or what will be affected. It's gonna affect those really bright saturated areas in there. And in fact, I believe there's a similar look over here. So I'm just going to create a, um, a just, I'm just gonna option drag this control point over to here drop it onto that red and let's take a look at both of those together and maybe make that a little bit smaller. I just, just wanna get those really brightly saturated colors. There it is, that looks about right. And also really wanna protect this area down here. So the white part of the mask, again, is what will be affected. The black part will not. So to protect the folks down here, I'm gonna add another control point 
make that nice and big and we're not going to do anything to this control point so i'm just going to position it right over their saturated clothing so it masks that and now i've got these areas nicely protected let's go ahead and take those top two here we go take those top two control points and i'll group them together and then take the saturation down on that so we're getting into some pretty advanced editing here already but effectively what i'm doing is taking the saturation down on the edges here but leaving it alone for the folks in the middle and if i toggle this on and off now you can see the overall effect in there you get some that's um, a little bit less saturated a little bit more saturated I think i'll take it down a little bit more let's just take that group down a little bit more on there make it a little bit more obvious of what's happening and again toggle that on and off there we go so that's a pretty pretty blatant so there it is on and there it is off okay so now that that's applied i hit save and remember, I have two of these multi-page TIFF files inside of um, inside of Lightroom. So I've got, now if I look at these side by side, if I go back and forth between them, there's the, let's see here, there's the version with the saturated oranges, you can see that up there, and there's the version without it. So I have that ability to maintain the editability and still have two side-by-side -side files. And at this point, I might decide, okay, for sure, I do like the one without the saturation, so I'm going to go ahead and delete the oversaturated one, whatever. You know, you, you have the choice, but the ability to duplicate that file when, you, um, when you're editing it, when you choose that edits, edit process, is really, really powerful. So now let's do something else in Lightroom to this. I'm going to crop it. Let's say I want to crop this for Instagram, for example. So let's go up here and I'm going to crop this photo. And I'm going to, I'm going to choose square. I know for Instagram, you'd probably do a four or five, but just to make this a little bit more obvious, we'll go square. I'll push it up to the top and uh, close that off. Okay, so there's my square Instagram crop. And I kind of want to want to add vignetting around the square shape because remember the vignetting is around the whole rectangular image, not the square image. So I'm going to do that here in Lightroom. Let's just go into Lightroom, and where are we? Um, boom, boom, boom. Here we go. Effects, vignetting. Let's just add a little bit of vignetting on there. Okay, so that's cool. But then I think, wait, wait a second. I've already got vignetting applied to this in the TIFF file. So I need to get rid of that, but I've cropped it, but I've cropped it in Lightroom. So here's what we can do. I can open up the multi-layer TIFF file that is uncropped, take off the vignetting or do whatever else you want. But in this case, take off the vignetting, come back into Lightroom and have that cropped image intact. Now, unfortunately at this point, we're gonna run into a bug in Lightroom. Um, it's gonna get fixed, but there's a bug in Lightroom right now that will discard the work that I've done. So let me let me explain a little bit of what I'm intending to do and the workaround that I have to do until they address this. Right now, if I right click on this cropped image and I choose edit in, we're gonna go back into Analog Effects Pro again. I should be able to edit the original and you notice it says here, Lightroom adjustments will not be visible. I should be able to edit original. It'll open this up, allow me to do my changes, which will happen. And then when I save it out of Analog Effects Pro and it goes back into Lightroom Classic, that crop, should be maintained it's not going to be right now and that's the bug so what i'm going to do instead before i do this is i'm just going to um well actually i'm going to go back into there i'm going to edit a copy of this this way i'm going to have that cropped version off to the side i'll then be able to copy and paste the cropping obviously i could just redo the crop but you know let's pretend that i had done a lot more to it i don't want to have to redo the work this will allow me to copy and paste that crop in so let's just go ahead and get rid of the vignetting entirely inside of analog effects pro and then i will copy and paste the crop over again shouldn't have to it's a bug in lightroom it'll get fixed so let's uh let's turn off the vignetting entirely there we go get rid of the vignette entirely hit save now watch, it's going to end up being cropped because they fixed the bug when I wasn't looking. Nope, there we go. So there we can see the crop is gone. It shouldn't be. Here's the earlier version that I had. So I'm just going to go copy and let's just check everything, make sure that everything's copied there. So that's going to get my crop and my vignette and paste that in. And now there's copied that, copy and pasted that vignette back in. At this point, I could definitely delete this other version. But now I've got the cropped square against the unvignetted color effects, uh, unvignetted un analog effects profile with the vignette added back in, in Lightroom. And at this point, maybe I wanna make it a little bit stronger and there we go. So there we have that ability. So just a huge amount of flexibility in here, which is absolutely enormous. Um, there's some questions coming up. We're gonna to come to those in just a moment. Very quickly though, I wanna show you perspective effects. 
Again, not the, the center of today's demo, but I just wanna show you something really cool. So here we've got this photo that I shot in Red Square and it is uh, a little bit a little bit tilty. I don't know, maybe a wide-ish lens or whatever. It's just the buildings are tilting towards each other. I wanna straighten these out. And you go, well, that's cool. Lightroom has quite a good perspective correction tool in it. Okay, so let's go down here. Let's find it. Uh, where are we, where are we? It is, I just scroll past it. It is split toning detail lens, no, not transform. There we go, transform. And it's off right now. And I'm just gonna start with the auto button because this is, I mean, this, come on, this is easy, right? We got the big vertical building. How hard can this be? So I hit auto. Well, it didn't do a whole lot. I mean, it kind of did a little bit, but it's not great. Well, okay, let's just do vertical. Well, that's even worse. Let's do full. We'll do the full perspective correction, full. I didn't do anything. So, you know, I could go in here manually and tweak it, but you feel like, you know, this should be done automatically. Well, perspective effects will. So here's what perspective effects is. Let me jump into this. This is the one all new tool that is part of the Knit Collection 3. This is a, a tool specifically for correcting perspective in photos like this. It also does edge deformation for super wide angle lenses. It also does miniaturization effect for aerial photos or elevated photos. Lots of stuff we're not gonna get into because that's not the focus of today, but I just wanna show you that this is here, that it exists, and here's the perspective, here's the auto button, one click on auto button, and look at that. Now that is perspectively corrected. Perspectively correct. Now we're looking at the right perspective. Take that. So this has done a much better job than Lightroom Classic did to make that change. And so now with one click, those lines are perfect. This looks way better than it did before. And that's the kind of effect that I want. So at this point I would hit save on here and then maybe take it into another plugin, another one of the uh, Knit Collection and play with that. All right, let's jump over to the questions. There's a couple of them that popped up on my screen. So I want to see what's happening in here. Um, this is a ah, super wide, give me a moment here. There it is, let me resize this column so I can actually see the whole question. Um, okay, first question. If you open a raw file into ACR, that's Adobe Camera Raw, duplicate the background layer. Okay, you can't when you're in ACR, but uh, duplicating the background layer and convert that layer to a smart object, okay would you not have the very same re-editing capabilities? Gotcha, okay. So what they're asking is, and thank you for that question. What you're asking is if you, instead of going from Lightroom, if you go straight into Photoshop as the raw file, so you're opening it in Adobe Camera Raw and then choosing to open it as a smart object, not opening it as a flattened layer, but as a smart object, would you have that same capability? Yes. When And this is how we've had re-editing capability before. You had to go through Photoshop. So you'd had to, from Lightroom, if you're using Lightroom, you would, oops, you would, here we go. You would right click on a photo and you would say, um, here we go, open as smart object in Photoshop. That would create a PSD with this as a smart object, which you would then add your filter as a smart filter on top of that. And you'd have that re-editing re -editing capability, but you had to go to Photoshop. Now you get that re-editing capability without having to go to Photoshop. There's no round tripping. You're doing it all in Lightroom. So. That's the answer to that question. Thank you for asking that. Next question, what happens if you edit in analog effects, save editable, and then open in color effects and save editable, then reopen in analog effects? It will flatten it. So as you go to a different filter, it will flatten it out. It only has the ability to do, to maintain one of those filter types in there. If you add another filter type, then it has to flatten it out. So the ability to re-edit is restricted to that one filter that you started with. Um, Last question is up right now. Show how to display the control point masks again. Okay, absolutely. So um, we will, I, I'm going to do masking again, control point masking again in another photo coming up. And so I will be sure to show that to you there. Alrighty, that is those questions. Let's wet the whistle and move on. Next, we're going to open up a series of photos just to kind of play with. So you've seen now, how to re-edit pictures. I'm going to jump back and forth between some photos just to drive that point home that we can go in and re-edit. And we're just gonna have some fun in Lightroom and uh, the, the Nick collection and see what we can create. So I'm going to start with, oops, wrong page. Um, I'm going to start with this photo here. This is shot in Oaxaca, Mexico. This is uh, out in the middle of nowhere. Pretty fun, pretty fun trip. Let's go open this in Color Effects Pro and um, let's see here, let's open this up. And I want to, 
I don't know. I want to enhance it. I want to make this picture better. I want to have some fun with it. So let's let's just let's just do something cool. Um, I'm going to. So there's that dialog again. Again, at this point, not sure. I'm going to say do not show this again. I'll figure out how to reset that for another demo so it stops popping up. But I, of course, have already enabled save and edit later, so we make sure that that's there. Okay, so in Color Effects Pro, if you're not familiar with this already, as I'm sure many of you are, but just in case you're not, the way Color Effects Pro works is you have a series of filters that you can add, and you add them into a filter stack, and that filter stack shows up on the right-hand side. So right now, there is a high-key filter applied to this. If I go up here to the filter library, you'll see that I have tons of filters here that I can choose from. They are broken down into handy-dandy little categories. Um, some of them overlap. There's overlap in some of these. Or we can just look at all of them in here. If you have any ones that you really, really like that you keep coming back to, you can click that little star to mark it as a favorite, which means that I can then go to my favorites tab and look at just my favorite filters. But as I click on a different filter in here, for example, black and white conversion, it replaces the filter that was over here on the right. So the high key is gone, black and white conversion is now there. Go to dark contrasts, black and white is gone, dark contrast is there. If I want to add filters, stack filters on top of each other, then I click on the add filter button. So at this point, I've got dark contrast. If I click on add filter, it adds an empty filter holder. And now I can go and add, let's say, bleach bypass on top of that. So now I've got multiple filters added on top of each other. To clear these out, you just click on the little X there, clears them out until you get an empty filter holder, and you're, we're now looking at the original image. So kind of fun, easy easy way to, to play with these. Um, I'm gonna actually go for a preset in here. Let's go down to my recipes, and we'll look at all of these. And these are a series of presets. They're called recipes in here that are a stack of filters, look over on the right, that have already been Put together for you and put into a fun little name and this is really just a great way for inspiration this is a way to play around and get some ideas for what you might want to do with your picture and so you can go through and just try out different ones this is called blue monday that's kind of cool kind of warming on the skinning skin tones softening out the skin a bit that's neat and you keep going through even on a cloudy day let's see what this looks like all right that's that's kind of cool it's got a very cool look to it um a kind of glowing fade this is neat we've got this glowish thing happening in the smoke and on her face and a little bit of a faded vintagey look and and just on and on there's tons and tons of different ones in here um, i'm going to grab one to start with that is called super punch so we add super punch to it and it's got this kind of contrast um a little bit of extra texture added to it i like it i think it's we're off to a good start in here but i want to i want to really make that smoke pop i want to really make that smoke come out so i'm going to add a new filter under here and I'm going to drop in a filter called Detail Extractor. Now, Detail Extractor, we can already see we're getting a lot of extra detail here in the smoke, on her face, and the wall behind her, and so on. So if I toggle that on and off there, you can kind of see what that's done. And I want that Detail Extractor, but I really just want it in the smoke. And so I'm going to do that with the control point. So let's go over here to control points. Now, the control points work a little bit differently depending on the tool that you're in. Sometimes a control point itself has all of the controls on it sometimes the sometimes the control point is effectively a mask for that particular filter and that's what they are here in color effects pro we are looking at the detail extractor filter it in itself has its own control points if i go to pro contrast it has its own control points uh, bleach bypass it has its own control points in this case i want to use the detail extractor I'm going to add a positive control point, which the only difference between a positive and a negative control point is the opacity. So if I add a positive control point here, this O, that's for opacity. If I hover over it, see it says opacity. And as I drag this up or down, we are changing the opacity of that control point. If I add a negative control point, it is simply adding it at opacity zero. That's all it is, that's all the difference is. So it doesn't really matter which one you click on, it is going to do the same thing, it's just adding it at 100% or 0% and then you can adjust it after that. So I wanna see what this control point is affecting. So this is one of the questions that we had. If I click on, open up the control point here and you see it's listed and then click on this little icon, this little guy looks like a mask icon, click on that and that reveals the mask. And now I can see in real time what that mask is going to affect. And so if I make it really big, it's going to affect the smoke, that side of her face. Remember white is what will be affected. The whole cauldron down here, the fire is clipped out, the, that side of her face is protected, but a lot of this is being affected. If I drag this down smaller, we'll see less and less of that's being affected. Now again, I want the smoke. So I'm going to make this kind of big, push it off to the corner here. I wanna make sure I'm getting a lot of the smoke in here. 
and there's smoke down here too. So I'm going to make a, a duplicate of this. I could just click on the plus to make a new one, or I can option drag on this, hold down the option key and drag this. Now I've made a duplicate of that, which is now independent. I can make that a little bigger if I want to. But now I want to protect the cauldron area. So I can, again, click and drag the opacity down to zero, or I can just select the negative control point, drop that down, and now I'm protecting that area of the image. I want to make sure I protect the side of her face too. So let's go ahead and add another negative control point to the side of her face. And that's looking pretty good. So now I've got this stack of control points where I am affecting the smoke area and not the rest of it. If I want to toggle all of these on and off at once, you have this mask button here that allows you to just turn them all on and off at once, just conveniently to see them. You can look at individual ones by clicking on the individual check boxes in here. And then once the effect is applied, so let's go ahead and take the detail extractor way up. Let's just crank that up there. A little contrast in there too. Really crank it up. Uh, let's go a little bit higher in there. There we go. Remember, we've got the control points already applied, but if I wanted to see what this looked like without the control points, this switch right here turns off the control points. And in this case, it's turning it off for, well, I guess it's turning off everything. So effectively, it's hiding the entire effect in there. Okay, so that's that applied on there. I got the control points added to the smoke. I'm digging it. I'm happy. I'm going to hit save. Okay, this is great. Love the image. All right, so now I'm happy with this image. I'll walk away, show it to some people, come back a day later, and I go, you know, there's this branch or something. I don't know what this is, but it's super distracting down there. I need to get rid of that. I, I can't really crop it out because I like the rock in here. Certainly can't crop out the fire. I could try and clone it out, but that's going to be a bit of a nightmare. How about I just try and reduce the brightness of it? Well, that's fine. Let's do that. Let's pick up where we left off back in the Color Effects Pro tool and just add that as another filter to the stack. Let's go into Color Effects Pro and make sure you edit original. Remember, got to edit that original. Hit up, hit edit. It's going to open this guy up. And I'm going to add another new filter to this. Um, let's see here. We're going to add, so here we go. Let's add another filter stack. So add an empty filter. I'm going to find, where is it? Uh, what is it called again? I want to look for levels and curves. It's probably under, under L. There we go. Levels and curves. Select that. Now, levels and curves is a simple tool for changing the exposure as a curve tool. I can adjust the bright and the shadows, whatever I like. And if I play with this a little bit, you'll see that I can, I can do a pretty decent job of darkening that uh, that branch down there. But obviously, I'm going to need to use a control point to make this totally effective. So let's add a control point onto that branch. If I want to see what that mask looks like, I just toggle that on. But you know, that's an easy one. Just add it on. It's going to do the work that I want. And so now, let's go ahead and darken this down a little bit and pull some of that brightness out of there. And I think I'll probably get away with pulling this down a little too. Pull the white point on that down. We don't want it to go gray. We just want it to be a little bit less distracting. I think that works. Cool. Cool. Yeah, that takes care of it. So that kind of knocks some of that back. But again, at this point, I go, you know, that was good. But um, the, the detail that I'd added earlier is a little bit much. Let's back that off a little bit. Well, I have all of those tools there. It's all in there. Let's um, add a little light to her face, for example, as another example. Let's add another filter. Let's do a let's do another levels and curves. Um, levels and curves. I should favorite that so I can find it easier. Add another levels and curves. I'm going to add a control point right in the middle of her face on there, and let's just brighten up her face a little bit. Let me maybe move that into the shadows a little. There we go. Into the shadow side. I'm not even going to look at the mask. I'm just going to find, there we go, that spot, add that little spot of light to her. Love it. Maybe make it a little bit smaller. So you don't have to look at the mask. It's very, very effective to be able to look at it. Very powerful, but you don't have to. It's up to you. Cool. Dig it. All right. I'm going to go ahead and apply that one there. I'm liking that. I'm liking that. All righty. Um, I've got a couple other, other images that I want to play with. I see some more questions coming in, so let me jump over and answer those. Uh, first one, after finishing work in color effects, I typically make a few small adjustments back in Lightroom. Okay. How do I open back in color effects with the latest Lightroom adjustments and still see the color effects adjustments? You can't. So if you want to be able to re-edit, then you remember when we did the edit in and we had the choice to either make a new copy with the Lightroom adjustments, right? So at this point here, let's just say I went in here and I changed the exposure on this. Oh, I want the whole thing to be a little bit darker. That's, that's a terrible example. Let's let's change the color temperature. I want to make it warmer. There we go. That works. I want to make this warmer. 
if I right click on this image now and I choose edit in, go back to Color Effects Pro, if I edit the original, its Lightroom adjustments will not be visible. If I edit a copy, Lightroom adjustments will not be visible. And remember, they should get reapplied when you come back, but that's a bug right now in Lightroom. It'll get fixed. Um, but there's that. Or I can edit a copy with the Lightroom adjustments. However, this is flattening the file. It says, apply the Lightroom adjustments to a copy of the file and edit that one. The copy will not contain layers or alpha channels, which also means it's not going to contain that multi-page TIFF. So if you wanted to maintain your um, your your sorry your your Color Effects Pro edits that you did and still be able to edit those, you can't combine them with the Lightroom stuff if you do that after. If you do the Lightroom edits beforehand, then you could, but after you cannot. So what you would need to do is edit a edit original, ignore the fact that the Lightroom adjustments aren't being made and then let those Lightroom adjustments reapply when you come back in. That's the way you'd have to do that. Um, all right, next question. Many asking, or, oh, <laughs> many people are asking about re-editing with Photoshop and the smart filters. You guys wanna see that then? All right, we'll do the next one in Photoshop. I will take it there. Uh, next question is, does this mean it's possible to go back and save a Nick recipe after you've already left the plugin? Yes, it does, which is fantastic. So let's say that this look, let's reset my Lightroom thing that I just changed. Let's say that I've done this work and I'm going, man, I put so much time into this. This is so cool. I want to save this as a recipe, but I've already left the plugin. That means that I can now go into here, edit in Color Effects Pro 4, edit the original, and I will now be able to save that recipe. So let this load up. Here we go. I can now choose save recipe, give that a name, we'll call it Mexico. And now I've got that one applied. So yes, absolutely, that's huge. Now, if you're doing this in Photoshop, you also have a last edit button. So if you haven't seen that, why don't, so the plan wasn't to go to Photoshop, but I'm totally happy with doing that. So if people are asking for it, well, let's do it. Well, let's do it. All right, let's go here and um, I will do the Photoshop round trip workflow from Lightroom Classic. How's that sound? So I'm gonna go to this photo next. Um, lovely portrait of this model and we're going to, instead of editing in the plugin, I'm gonna say open as smart object in Photoshop. Now this is a raw photo. In fact, let me do something else here. Um, let's see here, let's go to the library tab and what am I looking for? Um, what am I looking for? Oh yeah, here, I wanted to show you here. There we go, RW2. So this is a raw file, just, I just kind of wanted to prove that. This is a raw photo and go back into develop and um, don't want to do any basic adjustments, do a little auto adjust, Ooh, no, that's way too much. Um, let's take that down, but that's good. I've done some adjustments in here. Okay, so I've done some adjustments here in Lightroom. Now, I'm going to right click, edit in, open a smart object in Photoshop. This is going to, open Photoshop and create a smart object layer, which is itself the raw file with the changes made to it. So let me just move this out of the way for the moment. There we're seeing the image. You can see here that this is a, a smart object because of this little funny icon there. If I double click on this, it's going to open it in camera raw. So we are now looking at that raw photo and you see there's the exposure changes that I had made in Lightroom. So plus 0.95, plus six contrast, minus 67 highlights. If we went over to Lightroom, we'd see the same thing. Plus 95, plus six, minus 67. So it's all that exact same information is now here. Okay, so now we're in this smart object that is a raw file inside of Photoshop. Now let's apply a plugin. I'm gonna go for the Silverfix Pro. So now that we're in Photoshop, since we're here, I can show you the little palette. Um, this is the this is the selective tool that allows me to select whichever filter I want. And it's a at this point, it's just a quick shortcut. But if I expand this out, what's really neat is that I have access to my favorite filters in here. So and recipes. So under Color Effects Pro, for example, I've got contrast in black and white, Taipei, vintage, all marked as favorite recipes. I go to filters and here's some including levels and curves that I just favorited a moment ago. Right, that's showing up in here and so on. So that's kind of fun. But um, I want to take this into Silver Effects Pro. So in Silver Effects Pro, just in case I forget to show this to you when I come back, you have this last edit button. So if I had done an effect, and even if I hadn't saved it as a um, as a multi-page TIFF file, and then I go, oh, I forgot to save that recipe, I can come back by clicking last edit, it'll reapply the last edit that was done, and then I can save the recipe from there. All right, let's, uh, let's just go ahead and launch into the plugin, though. launch into Silver Effects. 
Um, also wanted to point out that the uh, this non-destructive workflow we're seeing in Lightroom Classic is also available out of PhotoLab 3. So if you're using PhotoLab 3, you have that same non-destructive re-editable capability with the multi-page TIFF. All right, um, you get a dialogue here that tells you, hey, SilverFX Pro has identified that the active layer is a smart object and will now operate as a smart filter. Fantastic, which means, again, I'll be able to go back and re-edit it. So let's see, I did actually have some plans for this photo here. So I'm going to do a little black and white magic into this picture. Um, find my notes so I know exactly which filters I was going to apply. And here we go. Ah, yes. I am, well, let's just start by playing with a few presets in here. We'll just kind of go through and you can see the dramatic differences. I, mean, I just, I don't know about you guys, but I love SilverFX Pro. I think it's just such a cool filter, uh, such a cool tool. Gives you some really dramatic looks in here. And I'm going to start with this one. It's this. It's called High Structure. It's got some structure going on. I love what it's doing to his skin on here. It's got this really cool look to it. However, if you look closely, look at the edges of his shoulder. This is not cool. It has done this kind of solarization on his shoulder there. And let's just zoom into 100% on here and really take a look at it. That is because that is where the image had gone to defocus. And that line was such a harsh line that the the addition of structure has kind of kind of messed with it a little bit. If we look at the original image, that's what the original photo looks like. So you can see that focus transition and it's fine. But here it you end up with this extra line. It just doesn't quite look right. I mean, I guess the extra line's already there, but it's just it's enhancing it. So we're gonna we're gonna fix that. We don't want that. So to fix that. Once again, I'm going to use control points. If you look at the global adjustments here, the structure is up to 33%. If I take this down to zero, then that effect goes away. So that is where it's coming from. So instead of doing structure globally, I'm going to do it with selective adjustments with control points. Now remember in ColorFX Pro, I pointed out that the control point there is simply an opacity adjustment between uh, from, well, from 100% to 0% applied for each individual filter. When you're in Silver effects, we're not working with individual filters. The controls you see on the right here are always here. And so a control point works differently. Here, a control point, let's make this nice and big, allows me to control the brightness, the contrast, the structure, the amplify whites, amplify blacks, fine structure, and selective colorization, all within one control point. So here, what I want to do is add some of this texture from the structure adjustment. I want to add that to his chest and I want to add that to his face. And so you can see there how it's really kind of making his skin pop like that, but we're already getting the effect over here on the side. So to get rid of that, I'm going to add another control point. And at this point, because it's not a positive negative control point, it's not a 100% um, or 0%. When I add a control point, it is effectively going to take over. It's going to take over whatever was being done by this control point. And it says, oh no, I have control of this area now. And if we look closely at what it's affecting, I kind of dropped it in just the right spot. Let's just zoom in a little bit more here. We can see that it has nicely selected that line in there. And if I move it up just a little bit, right? I've got the background, move it down a little bit, I'm onto his shoulder, but I dropped it just on the right spot to find that line. I gotta find it again. Where are we? Where are we? Come on, where are we? I guess that's a bit right about there. Let's make this a little bit smaller too. We don't need this quite so big. There we go. So we are kind of protecting that line. I'm going to do, do the same thing on the other shoulder. I'll just go ahead and option drag this one over and position this and find, once again, find that defocus line. And I want to get as much on just the line as I can. That's looking pretty good. Okay, cool. That works. Now let's hide those masks. And we're back to the image. Let's zoom out of this a little bit. I'm gonna select both of those so we can see that we're getting less of that effect, but it's still a little bit there. So I'm gonna show you a trick. Let me select both of these control points because these are the two shoulder ones. I'm gonna group them together so that they're acting together. Now, whatever change I make to these adjustments will affect both of them. And I'm going to go to the structure and I'm gonna do negative structure on that. So I'm going to effectively soften that area to counteract any structure changes that were happening from the main one here. And now we've got the result that I'm looking for. There's the original and there's the affected one. I would say we're getting an ever so slight amount of that um, that effect happening, but I'm okay with it because it was part of the original photo to begin with a little bit, but now we're getting where I wanna be. Now let's add another control point onto his face and let's add a little bit more structure into there and make that a little smaller. Let's get some of that structure on there. And, uh, and we're doing good. So, okay, cool. Let's go ahead and apply this. So remember, we're in Photoshop now. So once, since we're in Photoshop and this is a smart layer, a smart uh, filter, 
I can go back and re-edit that filter at any time. So let's move this out of the way. There's the original layer. There's the smart filter. I can hide or reveal that smart filter. And if I want to re-edit it, I just double click on that smart filter and away we go. So this does give you the ultimate flexibility. This does give you more flexibility than you have coming out of Lightroom Classic. Also because you have layers in here, I mean, you can add multiple images, do composites, whatever. But this also would allow me to combine multiple filters and keep each filter as a smart object, allowing me to go back in and re-edit. So for the person who had asked about having multiple filters and being able to re-edit multiple ones, you can't do that in Lightroom, but you can if you do this setup in Photoshop. So let's go back into the plugin. I double click on Silver FX Pro in there and, um, and away we go. Someone is asking if we always, if I always use sRGB. No, I'm just being sloppy here. I'm usually using Adobe RGB. Uh, yeah. Also, I wanted to point out too, I, I mentioned in the beginning that, uh, hit okay here. I mentioned in the beginning that we were not using perspective effects because it's not part of this re-editable capability, that's important to know. When you do the perspective effects correction, that is permanent. When you hit okay, that is done. It's baked into that TIFF file. You can't go back in and re-edit that. Okay, uh, so now I'm looking at this picture. I, you know, I was happy with it, but now I wanna make some more changes. So once again, we're back in. There's my control points, right? They're all still here. Let's take that structure up even higher, maybe, you know, whatever it is you wanna do in here. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna add some film type to this because I just, I just love it. I just wanna go in here and choose these different film types. Silver Effects Pro is so beautiful. And we can really go in and just find some kind of super cool look on here. I think I had one picked out that I liked. This was it. Yeah, Ilford XP2. There we go. Nice and dramatic. Now, at this point, the shadows in the background have gone super dark. A little bit too much. A little bit too dark. So let's go add another control point. Drop it into the background here. Make that a little bigger. And we'll brighten that up just a little bit. I mean, I can brighten it way up and totally bring that detail back in. But I don't want that much. I just want a little bit. Just a hint of that coming through. Let's option drag that over to here, make another one on this side. And again, I can group these. So there's these two control points, select those, group them. And now the brightness adjustment will affect both of those in the background. And I can find that point the way I like it. And I would say right about there, hit okay. And I dig it, I dig it. Now, if as I said, we can add another filter on top of it. So why don't we do that? Because we're here, why not? Let's go and do it. So I'm going to add, let's add. Um, where are we? Nick Collection. Let's do adding to black and white. Let's go, let's go analog effects. Why not? Go to analog effects. Let's see what we can do on top of the black and white. Probably wouldn't normally do this, but we're doing it. We're doing it. All right. Over a thousand people watching live today. That is wonderful. Thank you, everybody, for watching live. All right. Apply this. Let's, oh, this is going to be cool. Ooh, I like this. Classic camera. Let's see what that looks like. Kind of a cool sepia-ish. Remember, we're adding this on top of the black and white, so this would look totally different if it was in color. In fact, oh, this is cool. Watch, we're going to do this. Let's go, um, which one should I choose? Let's do Classic Camera 9, because I think this one looks pretty cool on a color image. So let's, I dig this, I'm going to apply that, hit OK. Again, we're applying this on top of the black and white, but that black and white is just a filter layer. So here I have my two layers, my two filters. There's analog effects, there's silver effects. Let's turn off silver effects, give it a moment to re-render, and it will re-render analog effects without silver effects underneath it. And we will get a whole new image. You can see in the lower left corner, we're seeing the progress while it recalculates everything. It's got a lot to do. And in a moment here, we will see what this looks like. If you've got any more questions, folks, get them in now, because we are getting ready to wrap this up. Um, there you go. And so there's that version of the photo in color with that analog effects applied to it without the black and white behind it. Pretty slick, pretty neat. All right, let's see here. Um, oh, there's a very nice comment up here. Thank you to the people who are making very nice comments. I appreciate that. All right, is there anything else? I, since I wasn't planning on coming in here, let me jump back to Lightroom. Um, oh, let me show you another, so, uh, another perspective effects demo, just because. So this photo, this was also in Mexico. This is, uh, an old church and the camera is on the ground tilting up clearly we have this very wide perspective distortion here now this is way more than we would need to be able to do but I, it's just kind of cool to see what we can do let me jump into perspective effects and i'm going to do the auto correction on here and i think it's going to kind of blow you away with this full deal it's pretty impressive so let's just go auto like, that's kind of cool. Now, if you look closely, because the image was so far off to the side, you know, we're looking at this from way over the side here, 
And when I do this auto, because of where the camera is, it tends to kind of look like I'm almost standing right in front of it, but not quite because we wouldn't be seeing down the angles here and here. But I mean, that's pretty powerful. Now, this is a really neat functionality of this. The image has been cropped. All right, if we go back to the original, we can see all the way to the top of the church and then some sky above it. If I enable the auto perspective effects that has now cropped off the top of the church in there and you go, hold on a minute, I don't want that cropped off. That should still be there. Well, if we look at the crop control, let's just turn off auto cropping. This is what has actually happened to the image. This is how it's been distorted to give me the look that I'm looking for with that straight on image. And you can see, oh, well, the crop of the top of the building is still there. So why, when I auto crop it, is it cropped off? Well, that's because the software is by default trying to maintain the same, or it is maintaining, the same aspect ratio of the original photo. And I can override that. So I will go in here and say unconstrained crop, and let's just open up the crop tool, and now I can crop this however I like. And I go, okay, well, actually, I, I want the top of the building, so let's just go up there just above the um, the windmill, or the, what do you call that, the, um, not windmill, what do you call those things? The wind vein, the something vein. There's a name in there, I'm totally forgetting. I apply that. And now I've got that back in. So you have that capability, you have that flexibility in there. All right, a couple more questions that are coming in. Hi, instead of a negative control point on color effects with a smoke, okay, is it possible to use a kind of brush to paint over where you want to cancel the effect of the control point? Um, you can in Photoshop. That's not something you could do in Lightroom. So let's go back to Photoshop. Let's say that, um, okay, let's just say that I've got this effect now applied over the whole image. And I want to take that effect away from the background. Notice here that there is a mask layer. So there's a smart filters stack collection, I guess you might call it, with the two smart filters. I've turned off Silver Effects Pro. It's, we'll just leave that off for now. Analog Effects Pro is on. If I select this layer and then I just bring up my brush and let's get a nice big brush in here and let's go, uh, it's going to be black. And I start brushing on here. I'm now brushing. The, the original background back in. So clearly I wouldn't do it quite like that. I would probably go for like a gray, maybe let's take kind of a grayish color. Let's go for a pretty light gray. I wanna do this kind of subtly and let's make this bigger. And there I can start to brush some of that out. There we go. So I'm getting a kind of a combination of that. So if you wanna have the ability to brush it, again, Photoshop. You gotta remember that Lightroom is not a compositing tool, right? Lightroom is meant to be a single photo editing world. If you wanna do compositing, you wanna do multiple effects, multiple images, um, blend effects between effects, then you would come to Photoshop for that. So there you go, so that's how that works. Yeah, and if you wanna look at the mask, option click on that and there's the mask that I created. Kind of a neat tip if you're doing this, let's say I've painted all this and I go, I just, I wish I had painted the whole thing a bit more so it was a bit more uh, masked. With the mask selected, if I hit Command L to bring up levels, I can now adjust the levels of that mask. If you look at the thumbnail down here, let me see if I can make this a little bigger. Um, how do we make that bigger? There's a view in here to make these bigger. And no panel, panel options. There we go. Let's make these nice and big. Okay, so you can see that mask right there. See, it's kind of a light gray against white. So again, with that selected, command L to bring up levels. And as I adjust that, we can see then that mask has been applied completely. Um, back it off somewhere in between. So now I have this, this easy way to kind of dial the, the mask in between back and forth, which is neat. So neat little tip in there. Another question, how do you know which Nick tool you last edited the image with? Uh, you have run into the rub of that. You don't. Um, if you come back to it after a long time, if you open the wrong Nick tool, it would flatten the file and you would lose the edit history for good, right? Um, as long as you don't apply it, you won't. So it's actually a very good question. Let's, I've never tried this. If you don't apply it, you should be fine. So let's go back into, uh, into Lightroom. And okay, so this image has all my work done to it. I'm going to edit in and let's go to Silver Effects Pro. Let's say, obviously this isn't the right one, but I mean, that's the point. This is not the right one. I'm gonna choose edit original. When I go into here and once it gets in here, we go, Oh my God, that's the wrong plugin. This wasn't Silver Effects Pro, it was something else. Okay, well, let's cancel. The image should be totally intact. Yeah, the image is intact. So now I can go in and say, edit in, was it Color Effects Pro? Where was it? Edit original. And yeah, that information of which filter was used is not written anywhere. There we go. And there's all of our changes. 
over here on the right. So we are intact. So as long as you don't hit save in that other plugin, you're safe. If you hit save, you're toast. So don't hit save. Um, all righty. Hey, thanks so much for tuning in today. That was a lot of fun. Over a thousand of you watching live. That is absolutely fantastic. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned something today. There's so much going on in here. It's hard to pack it into a, an hour long demo. Um, clearly I could do this all week long and still never run out of things to show you. So come back uh, for the next webinar, whenever that is. And, uh, and we'll, we'll get back into it. We'll have some more fun. Thanks a bunch, everybody. Take care of yourselves. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.